This opportunity has just been absolutely amazing. I'm loving this experience. I just enjoy every moment of it. Quiet on set. Rolling! Action! The BFI Film Academy is for 16 to 25 year olds across the UK who are interested in a career in the screen industries. The BFI Film Academy offers everything from practical hands-on courses to traineeships and mentorships and finally events and festivals. We run 50 short courses across the UK where young people can learn about the different roles in the industry and how to make a short film. We also run specialist courses where young people can really focus on a specific area such as documentary, craft skills, animation, art department, film festivals and audience development. Our labs and scene events are available UK-wide, online and in person. Labs are monthly masterclasses, panel discussions and workshops led by industry professionals. Seen are our weekly Instagram Live events hosted by the BFI Film Academy Young Programmers. There are interviews with young filmmakers, giving them a chance to promote their films and giving you a chance to learn from your filmmaking peers. Because of the Young Programme Scheme, I've really learned what I want to do with my career and I've made the contacts and picked up the skills that I need to to do that. We run the Future Film Festival, which is the UK's largest film festival for young people. We have masterclasses, panel discussions, workshops and screenings. Making a film in general is a cool thing, but being able to show it here at BFI South Bank is just incredible. We offer mentoring schemes and an incredible opportunity to take part in our traineeship programme, where we have placed young people on films such as Star Wars, Black Widow and Bond. This opportunity means the world to all the trainees. I would not have got this opportunity if it wasn't for the BFI. Because of the BFI Film Academy, I feel like my voice matters. Without the BFI Film Academy, I would not be in the film industry at all. So thank you to the Film Academy. <laughs>
last but not least, we do have Jean-Paul Lee, who, much like these other guys, has a really rich and diverse physical background, lots of martial arts experience, but has also become a hugely successful action actor, stuntman and choreographer, uh, as well as performing stunts on big films like Hobbs and Shaw, Fast and Furious 9 and The Batman, which I'm sure we're all excited about. He's directed his first short film called The Division and has worked on many more shorts and indie projects with a passion for filmmaking as well. Uh, he also worked on Cambodia's first major martial arts movie called Jailbreak, which was the first Cambodian film ever to be sold to Netflix, so historical in that regard. And he not only starred, but also choreographed all the action and trained many of the cast and extras. And he later returned to Cambodia to choreograph the action on a film called The Prey, which was Cambodia's first million dollar film. So it's a wealth of experience there. And thank you so much guys for joining us. Really great to have you with us today. I'm going to begin by asking some questions. And as I mentioned, you guys, please feel free in the chat box. You can submit some questions. We'll get to as many as we can. So first, I wanted to ask you guys, uh, what inspired you to get into, into film and specifically why action? Why not comedy or romance or something else? Joey, I'd like to begin with you. Um, hi, guys. Uh, thanks for joining the panel. Uh, thank you, Mike, for the intro. Um, I think growing up, I mean, I'm almost pushing 40 so I was born in 1982 so it was kind of peak action film movie um territory at that time so my dad used to rent action movies whether it would be a Schwarzenegger or Stallone film or Dolph Lundgren film or Bruce Lee film so I grew up excited to watch an action movie every weekend and I think I just got hooked as a kid on that and it never left me wow great and uh, Katrina, how about you? Thanks for having me as well, Mike. Uh, very kind intro. Um, yeah, I mean, similarly, I was raised by sort of older siblings. So I got introduced to the world of movies and sort of movies of the 80s and 90s really young. And thanks to things like Ninja Turtles and video games as well, video games played a big part. So I saw Lara Croft and was like, yes, that's what I want to be. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of movies and games and stuff were an escape and that escape was essentially kind of a whole new world that I wanted to sort of explore and get into plus I had an actor in the family my uncle was an actor so you know it was kind of kind of meant to be yeah and Nate for you why action sir um <clears throat> very similar reasons as the to, to Joey and Katrina as well you know that growing up we were surrounded by Ninja Turtles Mortal Kombat games um, street Fighter games as well, and also Power Rangers was around. So as a kid, you know, naturally you, you wanted to recreate the fights you saw on TV. And I think um, just as, as I got older, it was something I really wanted to pursue and actually take more seriously. Mm -hmm. And J JP? Well, it's the same, <clears throat> to be honest, the same thing. I grew up, uh, my father was a martial artist. So I was into Hapkido when I was uh, karate and Hapkido when I was very uh, young. But it's the same uh, watching Jackie Chan films, Bruce Lee. Um, but I just, I started stunt like uh, just nine years ago. So it's quite late. So I was just like a martial artist in between. I love movies. And I was like, maybe I should just try it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. And it's nice to talk about action filmmaking in the UK specifically. And now more than ever, it does feel like there's a lot of great films and TV shows being shot here, which is promising, of course, for the, for the new talent that there are local opportunities. You don't have to go too far maybe to, to work on future projects. But I'd like to ask all of you, what's been your experience filming in the UK specifically? And Joey, I'd like to maybe look at The Old Guard with Charlize Theron for Netflix, which you did quite recently, became, of course, Netflix's top streamed film in its opening weekend. So big success. What was it like for you filming here in and working with the UK crew? I mean, the UK has been renowned for particularly for its crew, expertise in crew, uh, practical special effects. I mean, if you think films like Raiders of the Lost Ark and the Star Wars films, Aliens, you know, James Cameron's Aliens were all filmed here. So even going back a long time, we've got a long tradition of um, quite key Hollywood action related movies being shot here because of uh, the expertise of our crews. So it's no shooting in the UK. It's not odd. I, I wouldn't say that, oh, Hollywood is better than action. Oh, but the UK can do well as well. I, I think the UK has always been one of the primo on par shooting locations. Batman Tim Burton's first Batman was shot here. You know, there's a lot of films that people think of as these iconic American Hollywood movies that were actually shot and produced here. So um, 
It was great. I mean, my, my first big studio experience was Batman Begins, Chris Nolan um, working on that. So that was the first time I was at uh, Shepperton Studios um, and seeing these huge sets and just seeing the craftsmanship and, and the sheer scale of what, what can be done here. So, yeah, it's cool. I enjoy working here. It's nice to be able to work in, in the city that you live in, you know? Yeah, for sure. And Katrina, obviously, Doctor Strange was a, was a huge film anyway, and a, a great film for you to work on. I believe you spent 10 months on that. Is that right? And shooting More the- or less. Yeah. How, how was that for you? Um, it was a really, really long job. It was also my first big major job and big break. And all, of, all the first happened on that job with the wonderful Jean-Paul Lee on board as well. Uh, we spent a long time, long time on that gig. And yeah, it was incredible. Like Joey said, the UK is just so, is so good for, for filmmaking. Uh, we've got amazing crews. So I had an incredible time working with the UK crew here. We were lucky as well, because we had US crew as well. So it was nice to kind of the best of both worlds, but it was nice. We were shooting in places like Long Cross, Shepparton, several of the studios and, yeah, it was it was wonderful. And it was nice to sort of be in your backyard making this incredibly huge Marvel movie, you know. Um, but yeah, yeah, that was, sure. that, that was a lucky break. <laughs> and JP just mentioned, yeah, you did Doctor Strange. You've also just done Doctor Strange 2 and Aquaman 2 in the UK, I believe. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people don't realise, yeah, these, these a lot of these films are shot here. So how, how were those uh, experiences for you? Oh, um, no, it was great to, as I you know, the usual thing is to work on in the UK and big productions. So you have everything in abundance, right? And it contrasts with the fact that when you do independent film, there's not so much. I mean, this is my perspective. Um, the contrast in the UK is that you do big action films, Hollywood films, but then in terms of martial art movies in the UK, this is not the culture. So that's why it's interesting. I'm, I'm learning everything from here. And I bring back to Asia because, you know, I try to make movies over there. But yeah, I would say working on big films is, is just amazing. It's just a big lesson. You just learn like every time you work on these big, big films. But then, yeah. You have an opportunity to absorb as much as you can and you can take these over, I guess, to indie films or shorts or other other creative projects you're doing. But Nate, I wanted to ask as well, you've, um, you've I believe, recently worked on uh, Masters of the Air, which is the new Band of Brothers sequel for Apple TV. And I know we're not going to, we can't talk too much about it. It's, you know, it's secretive as, as with a lot of these things. But I believe, yeah, again, that was shot in the UK. And what was that enjoyable? And do you find, obviously, I know you're, you're, you're obviously from the UK originally, you're based in, partly in Cape Town, partly here. But do you always find that we have a lot of good talent here and that they obviously, they, they call you back a lot of the time to work here too? Yeah, you know, um, yeah, the, the UK, is, especially with probably in the last 10 years, has exploded in the amount of shows that now go there. Um, and, and they're capitalizing on, on this now. We're building so many new studios. So the studios we were at now um, were the Apple Studios. Um, they're a little bit out of London. A lot of studios now, are, uh, there's no space, so they're starting to expand kind of all over the south of England. Um, and and just, um, just seeing the sheer scale of... of what these shows are, are capable of, the amount of money that they're pumping in and seeing like all these rigs, all these sets um, that they're creating and just the amount of people that are, especially after COVID are now being employed and, you know, getting to work on these big shows. It's, it's been amazing. And um, it's definitely, I mean, obviously look, South Africa is way smaller in terms of the industry here. Um, so it's really nice to be able to like go over to the UK and, and get onto shows and, and things over over that side and just kind of um yeah just see the the level and, and i see a massive improvement every time i go back it's another studio's opened up somewhere more shows are happening the the performers that you know i hadn't seen in a couple of years i've, I've just been working on stop and their level is just increasing and i'm seeing also just people who were just assistants maybe on crew are now leveling up in their in their craft as well um, so i think a lot of people are climbing the ladder really well in the UK, I think, from the amount of work that's there now. Um, and it is a really, really nice thing to see. Yeah, for sure. W one thing that a lot of people have said to me over the years is that 
building experience across many different areas or disciplines is always beneficial. And so, so not to discount, you know, seemingly random experiences or backgrounds you, you, you may have that you can bring to the table. So I, I'd like to start with Katrina on this. You know, you've got a really varied, interesting background, acting, performing, starting out in dance, I believe, when you were quite young. Um, and then obviously martial arts, adding to that, and now performing motion capture and video games. Would, would you say that all these different elements have actually helped you? And was it beneficial maybe on a film like Doctor Strange, which demanded the physicality but also performing dramatics and, and bringing all these things together? Definitely. I mean, in terms of a combination of sort of everything I did, that was kind of the most amazing first job. It was also the biggest learning curve. I was a complete rookie and completely had this moment for a long time going, what am I doing here? Someone's going to realise I'm not meant to be here. But no, I started out very, very young, kind of performing, doing dance and spoken word and that sort of stuff. And dance lends itself to choreography. Um, Martial arts was with me from when I was young and I started taking it really seriously after the death of my father when I was 17. So, and again, that even stepped up. Like as I, as I got into the world of action, I then met incredible people like people like Jean-Paul, people like Joey, people like Nathan that just inspired me to step up my game further and further and further. And I was just really lucky that at the time when Dr. Strange came, I was sort of ready, ready for that opportunity and to kind of, you know, take it, take on the challenge and kind of apply all those things. But yeah, yeah, it's just a combination of working on it. Like JP says, and like Nathan says, we're all just kind of constantly just working on those skills and trying to get better and better and better and just be ready, ready for opportunities when they do present themselves. Yeah, sure. And Joey, when you did The Bourne Ultimatum, which is obviously a very, it's a very significant and prolific, you know, yeah. film in the action genre, um, you know, it was interesting, you're coming at that, you know, not purely as an actor, you've got an extensive martial arts background. Um, so w interested, were you taught the fight very prescriptively? Were you able to contribute some ideas into that? And did your existing skill set very much help you in that regard? Yeah, I mean, that was such an overwhelming experience, being my big break. I was 23 when I landed that role. Um, I went to LA to train with 8711, um, the action team on the film um, that's owned by Chad Stahelski and um, the director of Deadpool 2, um, Dave, Dave, Leach. Dave Leach, exactly. So, and now those guys are kind of, you know, running Hollywood action films with the John Wick franchise of films. You've got this new bullet train film with Brad Pitt, um, the... Um, they're doing but yeah i think with the fight i mean you you had um jeff imada as the fight choreographer on the film so of course the fight choreographer is going to design the fight but they are always open i think any good fight choreographer wants to know the skill set of the performers that are going to be performing the fight because you want to play the fight to their strengths so for example in the born film um my character is this Blackbriar agent that's meant to be like an evolution of the Treadstone program that uh, Matt Damon's Jason Bourne is part of. And Jeff Amada wanted to know, he was like, well, since you're the upgrade, you've got to show something new. And during the training in LA, after beasting me for the first week I was there, they were then like, okay, show us what you can do. They sort of made me feel this small at first, putting me through my paces making me feel inadequate in some areas. And I thought, I haven't got a chance to show them all the cool stuff that I'm really good at. And then they were like, show us. So in terms of all the tricking and acrobatics and capoeira type moves, and that's where that side somersault out of the wrist lock, when Jason Bourne gets me in a wrist lock and I do the side somersault out of it, that was something that um, I brought to the table. And they were like, cool, let's put it in there, you know. So it, it is a collaboration. It requires input from the performers. If something doesn't feel right, if a choreographer and Nathan can speak to this or JP can speak to this, if you're telling someone the choreography needs to be a jab, lead, uh, left roundhouse kick, but the, the performer may say, I, I don't have a good kick with my left leg. Can I change it to a right kick? Can we, can we adjust this choreography? Yeah, you, you, you don't want the fight to look awkward. You want the performers to look comfortable and aggressive and uh, confident with their techniques. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. And, and 
JP talking about, you know, the, again, this experience in different areas is interesting. Jailbreak was obviously a great ent entertaining film, really, really good, good fun and a, a great historic film for the Cambodian you know, film industry. It sounds like it was a huge amount of work for you. And how did you approach handling all those different jobs from obviously playing the role of playing the lead role and having to train people and coming up with the choreography yourself? Um, and how did you approach all those different jobs? Did you compartmentalize it just to kind of deal with one thing at a time? And was it ultimately very rewarding seeing the film sold to Netflix and, and, and seeing the success it achieved? Um, it was... Uh, difficult to start with on jailbreak because before that I was with Katrina on the Doctor Strange one and two weeks later I was going to Cambodia to start that that movie so yeah it was difficult over there because we had no resources uh, no action team no assistant um, there's no stunt people over there there's no mats like there was nothing so um, it was literally starting from scratch and mm -hmm. trying to make an action film and I to be completely honest I didn't believe that we should have gone through i told the producer we should not do that film because it would be a failure we have nothing i can try to make a miracle but i think this time uh i don't believe in my luck so much so i think we should not do it but then we kept on on pushing it and then uh, we had no so we had no stun stun team there's a there were only like five martial artists in 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 phnom penh the capital and the rest were like 80 80 extras that i had to train alone for two months or something so yeah, it was very difficult, but I would not be able to achieve that if I didn't work on uh, these big films here uh, in the UK. No way, uh, no way. So I had to understand action design and then try to do it uh, in Cambodia, but it was so tough. Um, but at the end of the day, like when you went on Netflix, I didn't believe that we could actually do this. So yeah, to go back to, to what you said, then after that, how, how I can, uh, use my different skills in uh, in filmmaking. So I'm trying to see myself not only as a actor, but more as a, as a filmmaker, right? So everything, I, every experience that I'm going through, I'm trying to use everything for the next project. But it's, if I go to Asia, I know it's going to be tough. So I'm just trying to, I mean, like everyone, you know, get the experience and try to get better every 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 time you do sure. uh, the movie. Sure. I oh, know that's, that's that's great. It sounds like it's such a snowball effect, and that it came at the right time after Doctor Strange. You had this accumulated experience and everything. You know, it snowballs from there in a sense, which is great to hear. Um, and Nate, I wanted to ask you about uh, previs, which for anyone who doesn't know mm -hmm. is, is shooting a test for, let's say, a fight scene in this in this case, um, to look at camera angles and framing and seeing how it all uh, how it all comes together before shooting the the, the final thing. Uh, and Nate, if you go back to your old uh, three run st stunt videos, which I believe many are still on YouTube, if anyone wants to go and check them out. Um, you are actually credited for filming some of them as well as performing in hindsight would you say those early videos helped sow the seeds for you to practice shooting and capturing action and how to kind of frame it in the correct way think you know you actually developing techniques that you'd use later yeah totally i mean if, if i was to think back you were to like 2002 when you know we picked up like a either a high eight or a, a mini dv camera and we started shooting everything was always either filmed side on or face on and that was like the two angles we had uh, like that we would go to we didn't really understand many other like cinematic styles of shooting you know like tilt with the camera or move, movement with the camera and um and i still remember to this day like the first time i ever just made a cut of a round off back tuck and i just put the two clips together and it was two different angles and i was like oh my gosh like it actually I actually made a, like a scene I, I stitched it together and um and then over the years of doing that you know, we started, yeah, we started to really understand movement, you know, from, from a movement from left to right and how, how you can basically capture all of that movement in a right way and tell a story uh, as long, uh, uh, you know, uh, along the lines as well. Um, we, we used to go out and actually film mini commercials just for a project, you know, that we'd set up ourselves. I think it was uh, myself, Adam and Chase. Chase did a commercial for Nike because he had some Nike trainers. Adam Brayshaw did a commercial for Swatch he had one of the swatch watches and i did a commercial for volvic water and i mean it was just we was just going out filming random stuff but we set these we used to set these challenges combining the parkour and the free running element but now with a concept and uh so then you start to understand how to shoot stories you could you know mini uh you know commercials and then um and then you know i've always loved doing fight scenes and stuff me and adam brasher we always were shooting fight scenes as well as doing the free running stuff and um and just like the piece of movement together, you know, obviously understanding the depth perception when you start on, on camera, it's pretty much the same kind of 
formula, you know. And um, and then, yeah, it definitely just um, gave us the experience and the, and the knowledge to kind of then get to when you start shooting previous for for a show um, to be able to tell a story. The main the, all the way through. A lot of people just think you just put a fight together and you're fighting for the sake of fighting, but there's a reason. That's, the fight and the fight still needs to have a climax it still needs to be a, a moment in the fight where you think the hero is not going to make it and the villain's going to now succeed and all of a sudden now the the they flip the script and now the, the hero's the hero and you know he's defeating the villain or whatever or she's defeating the villain so these things we all started to learn um just going through the, the process from a very very yeah. young, well, very young age yeah, and I think it's really interesting to hear about the storytelling aspect, which I know is important to you. And Joey as well talks a lot about story within the fights. But it's interesting as well from a technical point of view that, you know, the stuff you were shooting for YouTube, it doesn't have to be big budget, just hopefully inspiring for people listening. It doesn't need to be, you know, you have a, um, you know, you have the high, the highest, um, the highest spec cameras to shoot. You can practice shooting angles and how how good certain things look and how things cut together. And you've done that. You've did that, you know, from your original yeah, stunt videos. We, into, we yeah. do all on road blades. You know, we didn't have we didn't have steady. I remember, remember the old steady cam was the counterweight with like the big weights at the bottom and you know, the forearms killing because there wasn't even a, there wasn't even like the chest rig you could wear or the you know the extended arm to kind of take the weight. But we were shooting it all on rollerblades because it gave us that smooth shot. It wasn't like a longboard, and you, you're in a sense doing the same as what a dolly would do, just with, with without the budget. You know, um, but the style was there. The, the the seed was planted then. You know, so as you go and create. You know, bigger shows, and you're part of a, a project that has more budget, and obviously you're able to now get these big pieces of equipment. But you know, when you're indie filmmaking, a pair of rollerblades was how it was done. Yeah. Absolutely. And many of the people watching will be, you know, new filmmakers and you guys on the panel have all worked with indie filmmakers through to big studio directors, um, you know, and everything in between. So I'd like to ask you guys, what qualities do you like most in the filmmakers you work with? And uh, like JP, I'd like to start with you because you've also directed a short film. So remember everyone, JP has worked on, you know, he, he worked on, you know, very recently, Doctor Strange 2, Aquaman 2, but he's also off shooting stuff with his friends and with his stunt buddies and making movies. What type of qualities do you like and appreciate in the filmmakers you've worked with and what would you then try to bring to your own projects um i would say the, the just to be creative i mean from my angle and my perspective for independent film i think it's how you can be creative and even try to challenge you know the big scenes you see in big movies right so and when you have nothing what can you do as nate said like there's many to to be creative so and i think that's the main thing that you should that independent filmmakers should push. Um, how can you do something great with nothing? And that's a challenge in every time. It's uh, mm -hmm. You're getting better every time you do it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Joey, for you, you've obviously embarked on, on this journey as a filmmaker. And what kind of directors have you, I guess, in a sense, responded to most and, I, and ideas are planted that then you like to utilize in your work and perhaps things that you didn't appreciate so much? Oh, there's so many things. Different directors all have different... Um, Skills. I think having a vision as a director is key. That's what I really respect a, a, a director who doesn't. Some directors surprisingly don't know what they want and they rely on the big budget and the big schedule to just shoot everything and try and create the film and the edit. I think directors that have a real keen vision, because as an, say as an actor, when you're working with that, you can really help best serve that vision because you're like now I know what you want as a filmmaker I can really sort of nuance and tweak what I'm doing as a performer to try and give you exactly what you want but when it's a bit of a kind of movable feast you're like you'd be surprised on some big budget films I won't name names but that there's almost no direction you're just left as, a, as an actor to, to direct your own performance. They'll maybe tell you if they don't like it, but they're not giving you that detailed sit down sort of uh, parent child relationship of this is what I want in the scene. And this is my vision. And this is what I want you to bring. So I think for any actors watching, it's really important to be able to self direct. Some actors don't like to look at the monitor. They don't like to look at their own performance because they feel it, it, um, contrives what they're doing but sometimes if there is no direction or no strong leadership you have to be a good judge of your performance you have to sort of 
read the room. What's the tone of what the other actors are doing in the scene? What does this scene need from me? Because that, as an actor, as a stunt performer, as, you're all cogs in a machine, right? You're all serving a purpose. And I think you have to understand the mechanics of a scene. A, a good example is this. When you start off as a, as a young actor or an extra, you're, you're, you're wanting that screen time. You're wanting to be noticed. But when you write, when you start to become a filmmaker, you realize that in a lot of stories, the only three-dimensional character is your hero, your main protagonist. And every other character is a two-dimensional archetype. It's like a pinball machine, right? Your, the actual pinball is the hero of the story. And the bumpers that the pinball bounces off are the supporting and small day player characters. Their job is not to scene steal. Their job is just to pose a barrier to the hero or the protagonist's journey and redirect their course or give that pinball something to go around. So when you understand my job is just to be menacing and belligerent so that it empowers the hero character when they overcome me, then you, you can tailor your performance to that. Whereas if, you, if you're thinking, I'm the star, I'm like you're, like you're trying to scene steal, it breaks the mechanics of, of what the narrative is trying to do. So some directors have been very clear in like, as a young actor saying, this is what this scene needs. And this is your responsibility as an actor in this scene. This is what you need to do. Nothing more, nothing less. Hit that perfectly and then the scene works. And I think that's something good yeah. to take away. Off, off the back of that as well, Katrina, you've obviously worked under Joey as a director. Would you, 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 you can comment on, again, what you like and identify in, um, in, 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 in the directors that you've you know, responded most to? I've been very fortunate um, and I was very fortunate early on in my career to work with some incredible directors, but I have to agree with Joey in the sense that it is to do with having a specific and very detailed vision and knowing how to communicate that, I think as well is really important. I think there are a lot of directors that maybe come from different backgrounds. I mean, they do, whether it's writing, acting, just whatever. And I think they all have varying abilities in terms of how to communicate their vision. Joey, <laughs> luckily for me he's uh, a training partner best friend he was a mentor growing up so I have a very good shorthand with Joey and as a director he is someone that has a very clear vision and he has the ability to communicate it very well as well as understanding his set and everyone on it and their strengths and their weaknesses so basically it's very easy to just completely just sort of hand over control and be like I, put, I have complete faith in my director. I know that my director has faith in me. I know what I need to do for him. And, and, and he knows my strengths and weaknesses in terms of what I can do for him. So it was very, that was the most seamless, most enjoyable kind of time on set. I mean, the production itself, it was Street Fighter Resurrection. It had its own problems and we were against it in terms of time. I was also doing Doctor Strange at the time. Joey himself was acting in another production. In terms of sleep deprivation, <laughs> that was the, the, the most challenging kind of job but it was a joy because I was literally just fueled by hopes and dreams and I got to work with my mates which is sort of the dream do what mm. you love with the people you love it's really that simple and as I said like having my best mate directing me again it's just it's perfect I know I know exactly what he needs and he knows what if I screw up he can tell me straight away and he knows how to communicate that to me to get the best out of me so win-win really yeah and um, JP and I worked together on Assassin's Fists. People may not know that earlier in JP's career, um, he was uh, doing stunt doubling for Gokin. Um, that was my first so we, big job on the film, yeah. Yeah, we were in Bulgaria together. Yeah. So that was that was a good experience. Thank you, Joey. <laughs> and I wanted to ask Nate, obviously, nowadays you're primarily a fight coordinator as well as a performer, maybe directing one day, watch this space, let's let's see how it goes. But <laughs> um, wanted to ask you, what which traits do you appreciate most in the directors or even actors that you obviously uh, collaborate with in your day to day work? You, you know what, it's always it's always a real nice treat when the actor has some form of training, you know, and, and a lot of the times that they want to be there, a lot of actors 
I've been lucky that a lot, like 99% of the, the jobs that I've done, uh, the actors are so excited to, to be there. And when you kind of get this energy from them, obviously it's amazing. It's, you, you want to work with that. You want to use that to, okay, cool. These people are keen. They want to put the time in. You know, we can, we can make this maybe a little bit more um, stylized, a little bit more difficult because they're going to want to, they're going to want to train for it. They're, you know, they, they're actually keen to make their character, you know, um, you know, to look trained. Um, the downside, obviously, is when you get a lot of actors that would just, they're just there because they have to be there. Show me what I need to do just to get by. And oh, you know what, the double can do this, the double can do that. And I think nowadays where, you know, say from the, you know, Keanu and John Wick and whatnot, a lot of the, a lot of the fights are them, you know, when they, they put in that training. And, uh, and I think it's kind of, triggered a lot of these actors now and new up and coming actors that actually see it as like a okay cool that's just the bar and that's where we kind of that's what we kind of have to get to now so it really does benefit um you know the, the fight choreographer fight coordinator um when when you've got actors that want to put the time in want to put the energy in um are open to suggestions open to um criticism a lot of actors or some actors luckily not many that i've worked with um they don't like to be told that their, their form is bad or they need to stretch more or they, you know, they're 45 minutes late and we've only gone for, for an hour, you know, these kind of things. Um, so, so it's really nice to see actors coming in with, with this excitement. And, uh, and also, with, like Joey said as well, um, when you're dealing with um, directors with a vision, same thing when it comes to a fight. Um, I did a job where uh, the director had no idea in terms of what he wanted the, the lead actor to be able to, to do. And I'm like, well, I can give you one side this and the other side this, and then, you know, you can see where you want. And even after showing them this, they were still unclear. And I was like, we're literally, you know, a month away from shooting this, the, the first day of rolling, and you don't have any direction. So that can always sometimes uh, put a lot of pressure because now you're just creating ideas for just, a direction, um, you know, in, in terms of what direction to go in, rather than you, you know the direction you've been given, you know, these ideas are obviously going to be used or not used, but not just to kind of help them in gain an idea of what kind of uh, direction they want to go in. So it's definitely very beneficial to have a director that one knows a direction and also for the actors that also come in excited and, and also with a background. I wanted to ask you guys about um, about kind of budgets and resources, because I think there is this myth that obviously when, especially if, if on lower budget films, you make action look great and it looks slick, which is obviously a great achievement. People automatically assume, you know, it costs a million dollars and it's uh, and, and, and it's kind of alienating for people that don't know how to do that. And I think we've had a couple of questions to that effect of how how these things are, are, are achieved. So I wanted to ask you all, all you guys, um, because you've all worked on big blockbusters through to indie films. And I wanted to ask what are the differences when it comes to action in those bigger and smaller arenas? And would it be fair to say, apart from time and resources, which bigger budgets will always give you, the actual nuts and bolts process of creating action is very much the same? Would I like to start with you, JP? I know you've talked about being clever and creative in how you, how you, uh, act, how you, how you design certain action scenes. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I was just thinking on what the question, but um, I would say... Uh, as an advice, I mean, the, the process is the same on big yeah. and small film, as in you must have a good fight team, a good action team, because they can make or break um, the action scene you're trying to, to create, right? If they don't know how to shoot, don't know how to create something interesting, something original in terms of fight choreography. Um, but as an advice, I would say, yeah, to get the right action team with you. I don't know. I think you guys should, might um, agree on that um yeah I'm, i'll let you go i'm still thinking about the answer sorry yeah. i was just uh... i think it's because because knowing your work and i invite anyone anyone watching you know you can check out some of jp's work online he's done a lot of shorts and indie films and like um, night shooters which was rain dance official selection and things and you know you it, obviously it does come from a large amount of experience you've got experience over the years so experience can't be short-tracked that has to be built over time but when you do 
over time slowly build your experience you can achieve a lot with you know working with good like-minded people talented people and achieve a lot on a, on a small budget maybe jp while, while you please do have a, a have a think about anything else you want to add to that joey i know on something like green street three you put together an enormous amount of fights on a very short sh uh, schedule so could you maybe talk talk to that and how that experience was i think look to sum it up on an indie film because you don't have the time and the budget you have to shoot to order more. You don't have the luxury of just shooting loads of coverage. You have to know what the action is and how you're going to capture it. So often on, on, on a lot of these things, even when you have budget, like on Assassin's Fists or something, I mean, JP will attest to this because he was there. I don't have a storyboard. I don't have a previs. I just know it. I've, I've shot the fight. I've choreographed the fight. So in my mind, I've played through the fight and done all the shots and edits in my head. So you've already got essentially a, a pre-visualization of the fight in your mind. Now you're just on set and getting what you want. And if you understand, obviously as a filmmaker, you need to understand camera tech, whether you need to achieve this shot on a jib or a crane or a dolly shot or whatnot. But I think shoot to order is, is the best thing. And it infuriates me on these big films, even the Bourne Ultimatum. That fight was six 13-hour days, exhausting, bone-busting. Now, we could have shot that film. Knowing how, if you see the end edit, we could have shot that in two days. But they discovered the look of the fight in the edit by shooting a master of the whole fight as a wide, then as a mid, then as a close, over shoulder, over shoulder, and you exhaust your performers. So for any filmmakers watching, have mercy on your performers. They're gonna do big hits or big wrecks, only make them do it once or twice and make sure you've got the angle right and it's gonna work for the edit. Then everyone can put full gusto in. Done, print, cut, let's move on. Mm -hmm. Don't keep putting people through the meat grinder unnecessarily because you, you're not prepared. Sure, sure. Um, and just, I know we're going to go to our audience questions in a minute. I just wanted to ask you guys, you know, because uh, collaboration is so, so important. And hopefully everyone here watching is networking and through the BFI Film Academy, people are getting to meet each other. Um, is How important is networking to you guys? And, you know, over time, building that team, building those contacts that you hopefully work with time and again. And, you know, essentially you can't do it on your own. Film is one of those few things. I think, you you know, you need a team. You need, even if it's a small crew, you need a, a crew with you. And how, how's the, how's this, um, this process been for you guys, uh, Katrina, I'd like to go over to you just in terms of collaborating with the right people. Well, I think, like I said, the dream for me has always been do what you love with the people you love. And I've been very lucky that through the course of being in this industry, I mean, in action specifically, you meet so many incredibly talented people in their re respectable fields. And I don't really know about this term networking, but what I do know is about making good connections with people that I consider friends. And I mean, everyone on this panel I've known for almost a decade really and it's that's not because I've necessarily sought to kind of just go and find people I've, I've sought to find good people that are great at what they, they do and to learn from them ultimately because everything in this in this industry and in life is really a learning experience and if you've got those people around you then you know you're, you're halfway there the rest is just you know just details yeah and nate how about you 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 obviously being a fight coordinator you must work with a lot of the same people and you see the same the same talent come up time and again is that fair to say yeah i, I think it is fair to say and also you know networking i feel in our industry is very important you know you're only just doing your last job and uh you know you have your show rule and to be honest for me like i've gotten a lot of my opportunities from showing my show rules to other stunt performers and other friends, not directors or some coordinators really. And they've actually forwarded my things on. And, and, and I've got work kind of like indirect through them. And they've in a way been like the middle, the middle person. Um, and I think it's also just great for inspiration, you know, like, and that's what the one, one of the very few good things about social media, I, I, I believe is, is that you're able to be inspired because you get to choose where you get your inspiration from. You get to choose who to follow, you know, and I'm, and I'm following everyone on, on here and, and I'm always seeing cool things, cool short, oh man, that's amazing. Like you're seeing what's coming out of uh, the US, you're seeing what's coming out of Asia, what's coming out of Africa, what's coming out of Europe. 
and, uh, and it pushes and inspires you, then all of a sudden you follow these people, these people follow you, you start talking, hey, listen, I'm actually going to be in town, I'm shooting a show in your town, well, okay, cool, next thing you know, you're on the job with them, and now you've just made, like, you know, good friends, you know, with these people, and um, and you're really able to also learn what they what they can show you, and then vice versa, I've always kind of believed in the motto, each one, teach one, you know, and one plus one equals three, I've always believed that, you know, each person can share their experience and then you can create a second or third entity from that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really do believe, you know, networking is, is, is key to, okay. to an extent in, in this industry. And we all, okay, I haven't actually, haven't actually met uh, JP yet or Joe, even though we've spoken yeah. for a long time. Uh, and it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. Exactly. But, uh, but we all we all talk like we know we've known each other for a long time anyway. You know, like it's and and we're always sharing stuff. We're always like, have you seen this? We're always laughing. We're joking about other people. Um, and it, and it's good. I think it's really good to have. And then, and then, and when you do get to work with each other, you know, it's just you're only gonna create greatness. Right, right before we jump into the audience questions, guys, Joe, is there anything you'd like to add in terms of building building the team around you? Yeah, because I'm 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 someone that likes to bring people up um and i think loyalty is important i think i believe if you're in a position to nurture talent and give people opportunities i get a lot of satisfaction and job fulfillment through giving people who are really talented that just haven't had their break yet that chance and watching their career grow and hopefully, you know, I think collaborating because a lot of the filmmaking experience is who you work with. That's what you take away. You could work on an amazing concept film, but hate the experience because the people you're working with. So nurture talent, be good to each other, be loyal, be respectful for one another. And then you all rise together and there's nothing more glorious than standing at the top of the mountain with a group of people that, yeah. you saw or started with at humble beginnings yeah. that's that's the dream that really is where half of the satisfaction comes from and J- jp would you uh, echo those sentiments i agree 100 percent. but yeah. what you said not about the team no it, and it takes uh, years to get the right um team yeah uh, i have like what maybe we're seven people right now in in my team and of course people come people go and you just know how but mm-hmm. joy said it's about their values not only about their physical performance but about who they are and uh, we become friends and that's the journey right that's yeah it. absolutely absolutely guys um just wanted to ask uh, we're going to go over some audience questions uh, uh, katrina you've got a question here which is is would you say is it more difficult to break into uh, action movies as a woman uh, if there are mainly male leads in action movies is this changing now perhaps with more more female-led action projects what what's been your experience with that I think, I mean, I mean, yes, in terms of you speak to most agents and you'd need to fact check this number, but still, it's still around only 20% of roles that come in that are for women. So naturally, there's just less roles. Um, what's obviously nice is that there is a push for diversity. But again, it's very difficult because, I mean, I, I grew up with heroes like Sarah Connor in Terminator 2 and Ripley and Aliens and and female characters like that that for me were just written perfectly whereas often nowadays it's almost like you're forcing something down people's throat this is the hashtag strong woman this is the you know and it's and it's usually someone that isn't necessarily as strong or hasn't put in the time to train as much or kind of that I buy as much as I bought Sarah Connor when I was a kid when I first saw her doing pull pull up sorry or Vasquez doing pull ups in aliens you're just like yeah that's that's a strong woman and it's not there's no that it's not condescending. You're not trying to just hit stereotypes. These are real, what felt like real people that I could really look up to and be like, you know, I, I want to be that. Mm-hmm. I, I I didn't really associate with a lot of the kind of supermodel looking kind of, you know, Hollywood actresses at the time, but I could associate with that. I was like, that's what I, I want to be really strong. Mm-hmm. So on one hand, yes, there are more roles for women. Obviously, there is a big push for kind of uh, diversity and equality, which is great. We are seeing more roles for women. In actuality, how is that translating into roles that or breakdowns that, you know, casting directors are sending out? I don't know, but hopefully that that will, that will yeah. continue to go forward. And with good writing, I think that's the key. Writing is always 
the key here. Um, yeah, because it all st- every, everything stems from the, the anyone's favorite film you can think of. It always stems from the page, doesn't it? In the, terms of the writing and the the yeah. filmmaking behind it, and action is just the like the layer on top of that. So yeah. for sure, that really makes sense. Um, we've got a question as well asking: um, COVID has hit the film industry pretty hard, um, of course, in recent times. How has this changed the way stunt scenes or action scenes are performed? I'll, I'll let anyone jump in there who'd like to try and take that. Perhaps Nathan, as a as a fight coordinator, sir. Um, well, right now everyone's got to wear a mask when you do a fight or something. Um, you know, you know, it's. I think it's really affected kind of every department on on quite a you know big level. Um, you know, there's probably less time to do things. Um, you know, uh, budgets are probably also a little tight. You know, because now it's, yeah, because of just just the times that we, we, we've experienced, you know, um, Cape Town, when, I mean, everyone went into a shutdown, but in 2020, personally, I worked nine days in, in when we had the lockdown, which was like nearly a year, I worked nine days. Um, so it was, it was pretty tough, but I know that was everyone's, that was everyone's, you know, situation as well. Um, and, you know, like now, like coming onto set and stuff after, after COVID, obviously it's tests every day and this type of stuff and obviously wearing a mask while you're still trying to um do fights is is obviously quite difficult um but i think i think apart from that really it's it's kind of the same you know people trained i mean all the all the all the people who are really committed to their career um use lockdown just as a just time to train time to work on the craft better better the skills like i very li- little people I know got really out of shape and kind of just let themselves go. They came ready to go, you know, be um, be ready so you never have to get ready. Um, so, you know, not much has really changed just in terms of the whole PPE thing, but that's pretty much it. Yeah. And we've had a question as well, which hopefully um, this is in a, in a sense been answered by some of the uh, some of the things we've talked about with regards to bigger budgets versus smaller budgets and indie indie projects. But I think it's helpful to reinforce uh, the question we've had is um, that action action seems really difficult to get started on with a low budget and small crew and inexperienced skill set. So I would like to point to each of you guys. Do you have any advice for starting out as an action orientated writer director with limited resources? And Joey, I'd like to go to you first. Sorry, please repeat the question. I was just reading the Q and A question. Okay, you were distracted with the Q and A. Yeah, it was about um, action being difficult starting on when when you've got a low budget, small yeah. crew, and inexperienced skill set, which of course is going to grow over time. But do you have any advice for starting out as an action orientated writer director with limited resources? It, it's a tough one because it's almost like saying. Is it difficult to go to war if you don't have a trained military? You know what I mean. Like, surely, look, I would, if, if I can just step in there for, um, for you as well. I, you talk a lot about writing and um, and kind of the, the 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 building the characters within the fight. So I think it's interesting that you know some and some of the some of the greatest fight scenes we've seen in film don't have to be the most elaborate choreography. You can have great writing and great characters within a relatively mm. simple fight. And would that perhaps be the direction you take to focus on the writing? Completely. Film? Look, I think people miss. Um, here's a really good. I'm I'm a full of analogies, as Katrina knows. She's weary with them. But there's a great uh, Miyamoto Musashi quote, right? Who was one of the, who wrote the Book of Five Rings, Japanese swordsman, is that at the center of every system is essence. And essence is very simple. But it's so simple that essence isn't often sexy. So you build this complex system around it. So like a martial arts, so he, Musashi only ever had three approaches to duels three preemptions or as he called it like strike before the opponent thinks to strike strike as the opponent thinks to strike and there's one more and he said essentially i won 65 duels based largely just on this but if i open a school and teach that people are going to think what there's three things so you create ten thousand techniques and 20 years to earn six stands to make it sexy but when this comes down to a fight scene Come back to the emotion of what makes combat. We've all probably had the misfortune of being out and seeing a fight break out, be it in a bar, on a street. It could be across a main road and you feel adrenaline and butterflies in your stomach. Even though you're separated by two lanes of traffic, 
seeing a fight brewing. It may not have even kicked off yet, but you're seeing all the preamble and the posturing and the look on people's faces. And it gives you a strong adrenal hormonal response. That's what you should capture. So many fights or action movies have 10 million techniques, but I'm feeling nothing as the viewer. I'm like, okay, this is a nice ballet of martial arts techniques, but I'm not feeling any emotion. Make me feel terrified. And you can do that, the build-up, the build-up to a fight, subtle nuances of how people are tapping their legs, the adrenaline, so someone's stepping back as if they're about to line someone up for a strike, but it's all hidden under... When you see people who know how to street fight, they'll, they'll start stroking their beard so they're ready to hit someone instantly. Use things like that, and you can make it a very effective action scene without a long convoluted fight just in understanding and capturing the nuances of what violence and action is so i'd say start with that and as you have more budget and you can bring in more experienced fight coordinators stunt coordinators performers then you can start to elaborate the complexity mm -hmm. of the sequence you're going to do Unfortunately, guys, we've got so much to cover. We're going to have to wrap up in the next few minutes. But would anyone like to add anything to that in terms of inspiration for starting out doing an action orientated project with limited resources? I'll say something if it's OK. Huh? Um, yeah, you know, you know, and that, Joey, Joey hit the nail on the head there. You know, it doesn't have to be a crazy uh, multiple hit fight you know when you're able to capture these these essences and it's the same thing when you when it comes down to you know you, you want to you don't have money for the the um special effects you know you want to be putting fire you want to be putting explosions and stuff and as you as you go you learn techniques to still sell the audience that there was an explosion you just have the camera on the guy's face and you just illuminate his face with the sound of an explosion in the background now that hasn't cost any any money at all really to do and 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 you're able to still have that same effect you're able to still sell that idea to the audience of there was an explosion they believed it now they don't necessarily have have to see it so you know you even as you as you go through you even start to go okay cool you, you're able to understand how to sell not just the fights but also just like the the, the special effects if you want to add explosions into things if you want to be putting muzzle flashes into things and, and how technology has progressed and you know what these things used to have to be practical you can now just get on a plug-in on your um, on your editing software you know for, for like thirty dollars and uh and i think now it's allowed people to to create very very low budget shows and shorts and you know fight scenes or whatever um with with selling it that these things were real you see things now that you're like wow the budget must have been insane and it was a few thousand dollars because of just these plugins and these effects that they're able to put in afterwards so um it's definitely the best time i think now to kind of get into into yeah. this world absolutely and guys thank you so much i think it's so interesting that all of you you know you've had amazing careers we've seen amazing progression but you, you're still intimately involved in independent filmmaking and you still you know being highly creative whilst also working on big budget stuff where you get you know all the resources you can you can possibly want but equally going back and doing you know shorts and interesting stuff so hopefully that's inspiring to everybody watching um I'm, guys we're, we're so tight on time we, we we don't have time for any more questions but really appreciate all the questions we've been sent um and before we wrap up i would like to draw everyone's attention to uh, the action extreme web series competition which we're just going to share some some information on screen this is a great opportunity for any new filmmakers planning their next short and um, please do take a picture or screenshot that that's a great opportunity you should definitely get involved in the, uh, with that and um, finally I'd like to say a huge thank you to our panel who've been super generous with their time and advice um, please do look out for what they're working on next if BFI could uh, kindly just change to the final slide please if you'd like to follow um, follow any of us on social media on Instagram uh, details are there really grateful thank you so much guys i'm sure if everyone could shout out to their computers they'd say say the same thing um a big thanks to the bfi and action extreme for presenting this panel and giving us the opportunity to, and the platform to connect with all you guys watching online and hopefully share some thoughts and um, some useful information which will help you on your journeys and we look forward to seeing all your work in the near future i'm sure